A blessed morning, everybody. Morning. God is good. It's all the time. God is good. Amen. So this morning, we're going to discuss winners never quit and quitters never win. You know, this has been a, uh, a catchphrase by many. And uh, this was started by, I think, uh, Vince Lombardi, a uh, football coach. And in, this, in the world of sports, this has been always uh, been told every now and then. Winners never quit and quitters never win. And it resonated into all aspects of human endeavors, actually. So this is also true in our Christian life. If we quit, we lose our hope of eternity in heaven. Now, in Jesus' words, he puts it this way. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. You know, life is without its share of conflicts, troubles. So goes with Christianity. We are not men and women that don't have any tribulations. But in fact, in John 16, 33, Jesus said, we will have many tribulations in this world. But as you know, Christians, we face more problems actually, more persecutions than most group of people. It was true then, as it holds true even today. You know, we, we talk about you and I being bond servants of Christ. Now today, we're going to talk about an enduring servant. Never give up. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 tells us, But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Now, the author of Hebrews, he was recounting to his fellow believers how it was in their lives before when they were, you know, when they were first illuminated, meaning when they first learned of the truth, when they learned about Jesus Christ and as they follow Christ into their lives. Now, they endured a great struggle with sufferings. Now, the author made the comparison. It was a comparison of their former lives, the lives they lived before having Jesus Christ, and the lives they now have with Jesus Christ, following Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, before, without Jesus Christ, they have it simple. They have a simple life, free of troubles, free of persecutions. But now with Christ Jesus, they were all in hiding. They were persecuted. Now, how can that be? How can they exchange a simple life to that of a persecuted life? Okay. They were in great deal of troubles when they followed the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, left and right. You see, during those days, when you become a follower of Christ, persecutions, it follows you everywhere you go. It's like a shadow. The enemy of Jesus will make sure that you will have a hard life and that you will suffer the consequence of being a follower of Jesus Christ. That's why in those days, if you are a Christian, you are actually a tough person. You are a tough guy because you endure sufferings of great intensity. It was like, Christianity is not for the faint-hearted. Now, I, I would like to refer those Christians during that time, those times, an elite force of our Lord Jesus Christ because they stood their grounds amidst heavy persecutions and sufferings. Now, ironically, the people, those around the Christians, the followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, they have high regards to those Christians because of their devotions to God, because of their commitment to their master, Jesus Christ. And despite what they have to go through, you know, they keep, 
their faith. You know, unfortunately, my dear brothers and sisters, many today, it's really sad. Many today call themselves Christians. We call ourselves Christians, but we are not living a Christ-centered life. We are not living what Christ tells us to do. They live contrary to what Christ wants them to live. But as one, uh, one person said, they are a bunch of hypocrites. We are a bunch of hypocrites. That is why in Romans chapter 2, verse 24, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. You see, many people, they hate our God. They speak evil of God because of those pretentious hypocrites claiming to be Christians but are not living Christ in their lives. You know, they will tell you, oh, I don't want to be a Christian. I don't want to be like you. Because you know why? Look at that minister. Look at that preacher in his foothill congregation. He is preaching about Christ-centered life every week, day in and day out. But look at him. He has concubines. How would I, why would you like me to become a Christian? For that preacher is a hypocrite. See? Many people today call themselves Christians and yet not living what Christ wants them to do. That's why again, Apostle Paul tells us that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of us, because of those hypocrites. That's why it was totally different then. Back then, being a Christian, you were tough as a nail. But today, no, it's totally different. Now, let us see what some of the sufferings these early Christians have to suffer. In verse 33 of Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Partly, while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you become companions of those who were so treated. You see, the Christians back then, they were made a public spectacle. What does it mean? What does it mean? They were put into public places where there would be lots of people and they were humiliated. You know, to be put in a public spectacle means you will be put in front of the public, humiliated, laughed at amongst the cheering crowd to the delight of the people. You were made an, as an entertainment to the people, after which they will be beaten up and mocked for the pleasures of the crowd. You know, I remember back home when I had this opportunity you know, to, to do a mini safari adventure. When I had a chance to uh, feed a, a lion and a tiger up close, where what separates me and the lion and the tiger is just a screen, iron screen vehicle. I'll put my hands out and there's a screen, just put the, uh, the meat, and then the tiger, the lion, you know, will get that meat out from your hands. And looking at that, I remember during the first century, during the time of Paul, the apostles, you know, Christians were thrown into the Roman Colosseum as a form of a public spectacle. It was like a commercial during those days in between gladiator matches. Christians were fed. They were put into the Coliseum without anything until the lion will feed on them. You see? That's how their life back then. The Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, in Matthew chapter 27, 27 to 31, the soldiers took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. They gathered the whole battalion before him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, twisting together a crown of thorns, 
put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. Kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spit on him, and they took the reed and stuck, struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him and led him away to crucify him. You see, before <clears throat> these followers of our Lord Jesus Christ were humiliated and beaten, it was first Jesus Christ who had to endure such sufferings and such humiliations. And at one point in, an, in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he was hit in the head. They were mocking him. Now, if you are really the Son of God, tell us who hit you. What kind of people are those people? Mocking the Son of God. Mocking your Lord, my Lord Jesus Christ. So again, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 10, 33. The second part, it says, And partly while you become companions of those who were so treated. Now, in other translations, it says there, When others suffered, you suffered with them. Now, it tells us now that not only Christians at that time were suffering and had to endure a personal persecutions, mainly physical one, you know, but the term when others suffered, it means when a fellow believer is in need of anything, let's say medicines, because he was badly beaten, in need of clothes or temporary shelter because his house, their house were burned and their things were taken away from them. They suffered with them, meaning they sacrificed and provided for their fellow believers. They go the extra mile of helping the fellow believers and provide for them. They share what they have. They become companions in their tribulations. They suffered with them. That is why in verse 34, it says, You had loving pity for those who were in prison. You had joy when your things were taken away from you, for you knew you would have something better in heaven, which would last forever. Now, an example how Christians suffered with fellow Christians is, you know, when they show their, their loving pity, compassion for those in prison. Now, how? Now, remember when Paul was in prison in Caesarea. The last time I stood before you, we talked about Paul being in prison. And Felix gave orders to the centurion that he said that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. The friends of Paul, fellow believers, were allowed entry and to give food to Paul. Why? Because the food back then was very bad. You cannot eat it. So that's why when you are in prison at that time, you have to rely to your friends to feed you. You have to rely to your fellow believers to feed you, to give you clothing and whatever it is that you need inside that prison. Because without them, you will die. So that's why these people, they provided food for Apostle Paul. And for those who are in prison, that is why Hebrews 10.34 said, you had a loving pity, you have a concern, you have compassion on us for those fellow believers who are in prison. Now here's another thing that we need to know in this particular case. When fellow believers, when they bring food, there is a problem. What is the problem? They are exposing. They are, they are exposing themselves, their identity, because they are hiding. So when they provide food for Apostle Paul, they go to prison, uh, they are now in the watch list of the Romans. Oh, who is this guy? 
tall guy, probably 6'5". Bearded guy. See? And they will follow you. You see? You expose yourselves to trouble, to persecutions. But they don't mind. The fellow believers, they don't mind. They already accepted their faith when they followed Jesus Christ. As if, and just inserting this, they were probably thinking, well, I'm good as that anyway. So what it is there to be afraid of? You see, what a courage they have. You see, brothers and sisters, during those times, you know, Christians, they take care of themselves. For whatever one was lacking or needing, they look out for each other. Whatever you need, we will provide. But the question is, are we doing the same to our, to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Now, we will have a separate lesson for that. Now, another thing that they had to endure is this. You had joy when your things were taken away from you. Now, okay, let's be honest, my dear brothers and sisters, let's be honest. If your car is taken away from you by force, will you be happy? No. No. Now, how will you feel when someone or somebody stole something from you? I remember. Now, when I was doing this lesson, I remember a brother. His, I think, motorbike was stolen. And in the process, in the, in the conversation, uh, this brother, he was looking for the one who stole his motorbike. He, I think he had his battery because he wanted to give the battery to that person so that he can use that bike. See? I think that that brother of ours, you know, he's not mad. Probably he's just sad, but not mad. And he went to the extra mile to go back and bring the battery so that that person, he was thinking, probably that person who took my bike is in really in need of a transportation, but he cannot use it. So I brought my battery so that to give it to him. No, but honestly, we will all be mad, right? We'll get mad. We will be sad. But these people, look at it. Look at this. These people, our fellow brothers and sisters, they were sad, but they were not mad. They were not angry. You had joy. They had joy. They accepted joyfully the plundering of their goods when their properties were forcefully taken away from them. They had to endure, you know, sleeping out in the open without pillows, without blankets, and probably go on for days without food because their properties were taken away from them. <clears throat> and they have to endure it until somebody take them in, until they reach a believer's house to feed them, to provide them shelter for a couple of days. You see, that's what is going on in their life when they follow Jesus Christ. Wow. Can you imagine all those things happening to them? And yet the Bible tells us they are what? Joyful. How can that be? You see, that is the big question. How can that be? Despite of it all, <clears throat> why <clears throat> are they enduring all of those and be happy? The answer is actually right there. For you knew you will have something better in heaven which would last forever. Praise God. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? Amen. Wow. You see, something better in heaven 
and something that will last forever. Praise God. Now, can I break this down for you so that you will grasp the secret why they had to endure so much and be joyful still. You see that the word new, the word new, which I highlighted and make it full. Okay. The word new means that they have the truth. They have known the truth. They believe the truth and they hang on to the truth. And whoever said that promise to them of something better and something lasting that awaits them, they believe that very person. And they have an intimate relationship with that person. And in this case, it was Jesus Christ who told them those things. It is our Lord Jesus Christ that became human. That's why Jesus said that he is the way, that he is the truth, and that he is the life. That is why Christians, they endure everything because of Jesus, with whom they put their trust and their faith. And with that truth comes the knowledge. She comes the knowledge of something better in store for them. Better that that was taken from them. Better than what was lost to them. Better life than what they were experiencing that time. They have pain. They are suffering. But they are looking for something better where there will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering and there, there will be no more hiding. And one that will last forever in heaven. First Corinthians chapter 9 25 tells us athletes work hard, self-control with discipline, strict training to win a crown that cannot last. But we do it for a crown that will last forever. You know, athletes knows how hard it is to go into training for a competition. It is not a walk in the park. If you want to know what I Trying to say, you ask Brother Darius Carvin. It's not a walk in the park. The Bible said that they have to work hard. They go into strict training. They discipline themselves. You need to have self-control. Now, I put the word there, agony zominos. It's a Greek word for that phrase, which somehow where we get our word agony. Agonize. The whole idea of that phrase is that athletes, they put their bodies and mind into great length of agony, great length of pain and suffering, you know, which they have to endure because there is a price. There is a price. You know, they do it for a price that will at last. Probably the money you know, those athletes were receiving. Those prizes, those money, they have to use it. And sooner or later when they die, they, they cannot bring that to heaven. They will have to leave it here. And soon, those will be consumed. But for those Christians, the Christians back then, Paul and the rest of the apostles, they endure it for what? They endure it for something better and for something that will last forever. They understood that a better awaits them. Life here is good, yes. Life back then, they will tell you even though they are, they are persecuted, they will tell you life is good. But to have something better, that's worth the agony. That's worth the suffering. Better is better than good, right? And to have something that will last forever, that adds more better to the better already that awaits them. So you have something better, and you have something that will last forever. You put them together, 
and you have heaven. And that is worth waiting. Amen? That is worth waiting. You see, many don't want Christianity because they do not know the truth. That is why we are telling them the truth. Many are quitting Christianity because, you know, the call of this world is much greater. Peer pressure. All of my friends, mi amigas, mi amigos, they are all there. They are all doing this. And I want to be there. We don't want these so-called friends you know, abandoning us. That's why I would rather abandon my Christian life than to be abandoned by them. They are exchanging something better for something that is temporary. Now, this is just one part of what the Bible calls persecution. And there are those I would like to call situational Christians. You know, these are professing Christians. When life is in trouble, you know, they take out their halos, put it around their heads, you know, go to church and talk about Jesus Christ. But when, but when life is good again, you know, they remove their halos, put it back in their pockets or put it back in their cabinets or somewhere, hide it there, don't go to church and never talk again about Jesus Christ because life is good. See? Situations dictates their Christianity. So that is why I call them situational Christians. Now, why is this so? Why is this so? Because they don't really know the truth. That is why it is really important to know the truth. What does it do to a person? Number two, to know the person behind the truth. Because the truth will set you free. And who is telling the truth? And who is the truth? Jesus Christ, your Lord, your Savior, the one that was crucified on the cross for your sins. Now, for without it, without knowing the truth, without Jesus Christ, you will not endure. You will give up your Christian life and go back to your so-called good life comfortable life, which is actually a life of misery, troubles, depressions, and anxiety. Now, that is why the next verse, 1035, tells us, So, do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. The author encourages the believers not to throw away their confident trust in the Lord. Upon whom they put all things. They put everything to Jesus Christ. Which Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he considered everything a trash, a rubbish, just to gain Jesus Christ. You know, the word throw in this particular verse had a military meaning. Throw away had the military background, which means cowardness. You know, during the battle, a soldier will throw away his shield, and he will run away. And that is the meaning of this. Don't be coward. Don't throw away your shield. Don't throw away your faith. You know, let us not be a, such a coward soldier of Christ because you know where you put your confident trust. Again, it reiterates there that there is a great reward that awaits those who will endure. And this is, in this great war in our lives, you know, Jesus Christ will help you win that war. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you receive the promise. Now the question, how to have spiritual endurance? You see, the Bible tells us you need to endure. You need to have endurance so that you can withstand persecutions, sufferings, the pressure from your friends. Now, how to have spiritual endurance? Number one, the Bible tells us we have to strip off every weight that slows, that slows us down. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, 
let us strip off every weight that slows us down. You know, take those things that are turning your life away from God. Take it off. Take it off away. Throw it away. Now, this includes, this includes the blessings that you have that are becoming into a curse into you. See? The material blessings, the blessings of relationship, even family, even friends. Don't let these things, these people, affect your growth with Christ. But if these things are slowing you, taking away your Christian progress, taking away your faith from God, you must weigh your options and make decisions. The so number two, it says strip off especially the sin that so easily trip us. Again, going back there in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says that especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Okay. Now, what does it mean? The Bible made a special mention about sin because sin, however you look at it, it is a sin. It is detestable to God. So it must be dealt with immediately and must be taken out of your life immediately. You know, evil and God cannot reign jointly in a man's heart, in a man's life. Sin is what makes us fall short of the glory of God. It is what holds you down and trips you all the time so that you will miss heaven. So take sin out of your life. Now, number three, keep your eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12.2 it says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Now, verse 1 of Hebrews 12, it says, we run the endurance. How do they run that endurance? Verse 2, it tells us, we do it this way. How? They do it by keeping their eyes on Jesus. Jesus Christ. Jesus, he sets the standards we are to follow. And through his own example of sheer great sufferings, he was teaching all his followers. He was teaching us that the task, the challenge, you know, the joy, the glory of heaven before all of us is not something that is impossible to obtain, but one that is achievable. Now, through patient endurance, with God in your life and focusing on Him, Jesus proved to all that nothing is impossible. He did it. Remember that Jesus was in all shape and form human when He was here on earth. So, don't make it an excuse and compare yourself. Well, Brother Mike, Jesus is God and I am not. In all shape and form, Jesus just like you when he was here on earth. And he proved that we can achieve something if we put Christ and God into our life. Number four, enjoy. How to have spiritual endurance? Enjoy. Hebrews 12, 2, again, it says, because of the joy awaiting him. You know, some translations, it says, for the sake of the joy. So what do I mean that you have to enjoy? One of the reasons, you know, many conflicts arises between parents and children. Oh, excuse me, parents and children. Why there are, there are some conflicts between the parents and children, especially when children are going to college? Because some parents, they dictate what their children have to take in college. Now, when their children go to college, taking what their parents want, and soon realizes that it is not what they really want, they drop out of college. Why? Because they are not enjoying, because that is not what they want. See? And same thing. Athletes, 
They go into strict training. They endure. They suffer. They agonize. Why? Are they not enjoying? Oh, yes, they are enjoying. They love what they are doing. That's why they are suffering. That's why they are enduring. Because they want what they are doing. They love it. They enjoy it. So Christians, like you and I, although we are suffering, ask yourself about this. Why are you here? Why are you here today? Why are you listening to me? Are you not enjoying your Christian life? Or are you enjoying your Christian life? Hallelujah. Now you get the point. We enjoy our Christian life. Now can you tell the person beside you, I enjoy my Christian life. I enjoy, Brother Charles. See? I enjoy. We enjoy our Christian life. We are happy. Then lastly, we have to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 18 tells us, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Growth is by far essential in life. Your cells need to grow. Your bones need to grow. Mentally, we need to grow. The economy needs to grow. And so does your faith in the Lord needs to grow. The word grow in this uh, particular verse is progressive tense, meaning ongoing process, never ending. It does not stop. Now, growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, Christ being the object of our faith, means we deepen and deepen our relationship with Him by truly knowing Him, what He did on the cross and what He continuously doing in your life, in your family, and in your friends. Now, growing in the grace means that you, you receive that love you are the recipient of that grace. You are the recipient of that forgiveness, of that mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in return, you have to give the same love, the same kindness, the same mercy, the same forgiveness that you once received when you were a sinner. And that is grace. And that is the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, you become more and more like Him. Brothers, sisters, and friends, the lesson is yours. Brethren, my appeal to you, my appeal to all of you, never give up. Let us fight a good fight. Endure. Those who have not yet accepted the Lord, come to Jesus and be assured of a better and lasting possessions in eternity with God. Finally, let me leave you with this final thought by Apostle Paul. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. God bless you all. Shall we stand as we sing the song of invitation?